Thank you. Good morning. Alex and I are absolutely thrilled to be here with you. One, it's Vancouver. What could be a more beautiful city? Uh, number two, uh, we're big fans of our co-chairs. So Aria, Ian, thank you for inviting us. And uh, three, the Healthy Kids panel, panel. We are unbelievably proud of the process of the panel as well as its output. Uh, if you think about kids, there is nothing more important uh, in this country than the children, this generation, generations to come. And we feel really proud of the set of recommendations that the Healthy Kids panel, an 18-person panel, uh, set forth for the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario. I would tell you that the process itself was probably the most challenging of my career. So there are 18 people on this panel who are really, really smart, very talented, with very diverse and strong opinions. And I would also tell you it was probably one of the most rewarding uh, experiences of my career. So uh, we're delighted over the next 20 minutes to share with you the process of creating the Healthy Kids panel report and as well the content of that report. So have a look at this quote. It's uh, from Dr. Yoni Friedhoff, who is, uh, we have a measurable respect for, and uh, is a tough critic in many cases and in many ways. And uh, he was a bit of a tough critic on us uh, when we started, both Alex and I. How on earth did we ever get the jobs of co-chairs of this panel? And uh, then the 18 people that, were, that joined us on that panel, how on earth did they ever get on that panel? And so uh, it is with that sort of context uh, that we loved his response to the report that we created, that childhood obesity is not about eating less and moving more. And uh, when he refers there to the 30, 23 sandbags, we created 23 recommendations under three prongs uh, in the strategy that we made recommendations about. And uh, truly, uh, I love the last part of this, that those sandbags may in fact help to uh, solve or save us from a flood as opposed to managing a flood by teaching kids how to swim. So uh, Alex has used your quote in, in uh, presentations in the past and then we laughed when uh, Yoni was here on the panel with us. Why it matters. I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, you know the stats better than Alex or I, but we wanted to give you some context for uh, the, the panel's report. So we know that in Ontario that almost a third of the kids in Ontario are obese or overweight. We know that in Canada, childhood obesity has doubled, almost tripled in the last three decades. We know that 75% of obese children become obese parents. And in Ontario, where the panel was set, uh, $4.5 billion per year costs of childhood obesity. So this is an unsustainable situation from an economic perspective, certainly, but from a life uh, perspective, most certainly. Why a panel? So Minister Deb Matthews, again, Ontario Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, uh, decided to put together this panel. She wanted it to be very diverse. She wanted us to represent many, many different backgrounds. And uh, we, we came together in May of 2012. We worked together for almost eight months. And uh, as, you, as you can see up there, we had uh, sectors represented health, health promotion, public health, education, academics, media, community organizations. And our mandate was to reduce childhood obesity by 20% over five years. And uh, our very first meeting, 18 panel members sitting around the table, there was a massive debate and thinking, this is a ridiculous goal. This is not an audacious goal. This is a ridiculous goal. We should just pack up now and head home because there's no way we can set forth any kind of recommendations that would ever achieve that goal. Eventually, we came around to saying, OK, that's a political goal. It is set to be audacious, and what we believe is it's giving us, as a panel, permission to go big. That yes, our recommendations must be feasible, they must be cost effective, but we must think big in order to achieve, at least in the realm of such an audacious goal. Uh, the uh, panel was given just four uh, criteria to meet. Needed to be evidence-informed solutions, public accountability, cost effectiveness in consideration of global provincial austerity measures, and visibility or viability for implementation. That was it. No constraints beyond that. And some of our panel members are actually here today. So Neil Seaman uh, was a panel member. Phyllis Tanaka is here, was one of our panel members. And I would also offer, uh, we had panel members from Hospital of Sick Kids, 
Windsor Essex Community Health, we had a journalist, we had YMCA represented, we had U of T represented, we had the uh, Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Centre, uh, Ben Simon Byrne, private sector, and Right to Play, uh, and then we also had government on the, on the panel. So it really was a broad cross-section when I talk to you about challenging people with very strong opinions. I'm not kidding. So that panel, as soon as we got together, we said uh, we need to work off the brilliant work that has been done before that already exists. It made no sense to us to start from scratch. And so you can see the process that we went through. We went through more than 50 uh, reports and analyses that already exist in the country, but also internationally. Uh, we met with 19 thought leaders, and some of those thought leaders are here today. So Dr. Yoni Friedhoff was one of them, Dr. Arish Sharma, Dr. Mark Tremblay, Dr. Diane Feingood. So 19 thought leaders, uh, they came and presented, and we were able to interact and have dialogue with them. Uh, we also met with sector associations in health, food, hospitality, so that covered the broad spectrum of public sector, private sector. And uh, most importantly, we surveyed parents. And I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but we surveyed over 2,000 parents, uh, many of them from economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, from all diverse backgrounds in terms of culture, race. Uh, and we wanted to understand what do parents think of childhood obesity? How do they define it? How do they experience it? What do they think about it? We also wanted to speak with kids. And so we spoke with youth. And we did more than 10 focus group uh, sessions with youth to understand their perspective. How do they feel about childhood obesity? How do they define it? And then as well as it says there, we did focus group sessions with parents. So in the GTA and Sudbury, and again in both official languages. We truly wanted to understand not just what the experts think, but truly what the true experts think, parents and kids. And what we learned was childhood obesity is very complex. So this isn't just move more, eat less. There are many, many factors that, that contribute to the current state of childhood obesity in the province of Ontario and in this country. We also learned that there is absolutely no consensus about how to solve it. There's certainly consensus that this is a critical issue, this is an urgent issue. There is no consensus, at least that we experienced, our panel experienced, in terms of how to solve it. And some of the experts we met with, we would say, so what do you, what do you think we should do? And they're like, good luck with that. Um, so there's no consensus about what to do about it, but there's definitely consensus that this is a massive issue in our country. With like tobacco control, it's going to take a stacking of initiatives to resolve. And so it's not just do this, then this, then this, and magically it's done, and there are no magic bullets. This is a stacking of uh, recommendations and, and uh, perspectives that we need to take because this is a very complex issue. But unlike tobacco, our panel believes strongly it was really important to have all stakeholders at the table including industry. So if we want to manage and, in fact, change the trajectory of childhood obesity in this country, in that province, we need to make sure that not-for-profit, public sector, and private sectors are all represented. And finally, I would tell you that um, from the very first meeting, we were clear that we wanted this to be taken through the lens of parents and children. This is not about finger wagging and telling parents what they need to do differently because they're doing a crummy job at raising their children. We wanted to understand what parents think, how they feel, and tell us what, what they need. And so the report, uh, and I left several of them out there on the table, they look like this. The report has worked extremely hard and diligently to make sure that we are saying, you know what? This is, parents know, first of all, uh, they love their children more than anything in the world, and they want their children to be happy and healthy. They actually know what it takes to make their children happy and healthy. They want to be responsible for their kids. They're not looking for anyone else to assume responsibility or accountability for their kids. What they do need, though, is help from all of us from those three sectors that I just mentioned to make the healthy choice the easy choice 
every time. And so Alex is going to come up and, and talk with you about the actual report and the comprehensive three-pronged strategy. And as you listen and hear the uh, content of that report, I, I hope that you'll understand that all of it is designed to be coming through the lens of parents and youth themselves, letting us know what they need in order to raise healthier kids. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kelly, and it, uh, it is great uh, to be here in beautiful British Columbia. And I'm just going to walk you through uh, our uh, our recommendations, our three-pronged strategy, uh, to underscore what Kelly said a moment ago around the filter for our recommendations, which was from the perspective of parents and families, what can we do about the environment of, around kids uh, to support parents? Uh, to, as has been said, make the healthy choice the, the easy choice, but also to ensure uh, that the uh, environment is supportive uh, of what parents know uh, they need to do or parents want to do. Um, and then we had, as Kelly mentioned, we, considered, we literally considered hundreds and hundreds of different ideas. So how do we get from 100 down to 23? So the first filter then was, what do parents need to that parental perspective? The second was, where is their evidence? Uh, proven uh, science or emerging evidence, uh, but what does the evidence tell us? And then the third, and very, very important in the economic uh, climate of Ontario, is from a feasibility point of view, what can we lever? What have we got in terms of delivery channels, if you want to think of it that way, in the province of Ontario, that we can scale up? Where are there programs uh, that we could uh, use as the basis for uh, meeting our ambitious goal of 20% uh, reduction over uh, five years? And so our recommendation to government then is this three-pronged strategy that you see here, starting all kids on the path to health, changing the food environment, and building healthy communities. It's 23 recommendations, and our argument to the government is that if you want to uh, make that progress, if you want to achieve that goal, uh, then uh, this is not a menu to order off of. This is a comprehensive strategy, and that you can pull out any one of these recommendations. You can pull out any one and say, well, that recommendation on its own will not uh, reduce overweight obesity, and you'd be absolutely right. It's a comprehensive approach. It's the stacking uh, of initiatives. So starting all kids on the path to health, five recommendations, the focus of, on prenatal care and then the care of uh, newborns uh, and infants. I know uh, Christy Damo from CHEO, if I can do an advertorial for, uh, for the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario uh, and uh, the HALO research group uh, at the hospital uh, will be presenting uh, later this, uh, this afternoon. Lots of evidence, obviously, uh, across a whole range of issues, but certainly as it relates uh, uh, as it relates to overweight and obesity, a uh, whole lot of evidence obviously around the health of uh, women while they're pregnant, the health of women before they become pregnant, uh, and then the, the care of, uh, uh, the care of uh, infants and babies um, uh, in terms of breastfeeding, but also in terms of the opportunity we have because of the many, many interactions between the health delivery system uh, and mothers and newborns uh, to really be supporting uh, moms uh, and families. And so five uh, recommendations uh, in that area. Uh, changing the food environment, uh, eight recommend uh, sorry, ten recommendations, and really uh, two thrusts here. Uh, a lot of media attention when the report uh, uh, came out to our recommendations around uh, the uh, ban on marketing. Uh, that targets children under 12, uh, banning the point of sale, uh, promotion of high calorie, uh, low uh, nutrient foods uh, in retail settings, and, that, and we would recommend starting with uh, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, and the mandatory um, menu labeling uh, in restaurants. And again, um, lots of debate about all of those, uh, but our view that it is in fact fairer to industry uh, to regulate and to have a level playing field uh, and that uh, in fact again this is about changing the food environment this is a re uh, this is about the environment 
uh, uh, when families go out, when families go shopping, uh, and frankly, and you know, I think of one mom, I can't remember now which focus group uh, it was, but the comment that uh, uh, y you know she feels she's up against a multi-billion-dollar marketing industry. Uh, and feels it's a bit of an unfair fight. And uh, won't you help me out here, please? And so uh, some of these uh, regulatory measures really uh, finding their genesis in what we uh, heard from parents and what public opinion research will demonstrate is in fact broadly supported, although not universally so. So regulating on one hand, but then the other piece of that as well, very important obviously, is the availability. Of, uh, of, of healthy food options and uh, uh, looking at issues like uh, school nutrition programs, uh, incentives to food retailers to address um, the issue of food deserts uh, and scaling up a number of the programs that are already in place in Ontario. And then lastly, uh, building healthy communities and eight recommendations. Really here looking at the, the social environment, the built form, uh, and the uh, connection to the social determinants of health. So in Ontario, uh, we have uh, poverty reduction and uh, mental health uh, strategies underway. Uh, there's a presentation earlier this morning from BC Children's uh, around the link between mental health and, uh, and uh, obesity, for example. Uh, so uh, clearly, on, again, on that principle of levering, um, leveraging rather the the uh, assets we have, making sure that the government, which in Ontario around the mental health strategy, has to make a choice as to whether or not to consider with children and youth or to broaden it to the whole population, really continuing uh, to focus in those areas. Uh, and then looking at uh, social marketing, um, we were impressed by EPODE and the evidence uh, of uh, the results that it has produced in other countries and uh, recommending uh, that it start to be rolled out in Ontario and then looking at the skills that uh, professionals who work with kids uh, have, how they're trained as well as the, uh, the school environment. And again, there's copies of the report uh, outside and it's obviously also available online. So, um, uh, oh, this is... Um, so, in fact, this is a different presentation. This is my next presentation. Um, so, if you're from public health, this is what I'll be telling the Ottawa Board of Health. Because, um, um, in fact, public health, and so, uh, and I was, I'll just practice for Monday. Um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the in, if, you, if you go through our 23 recommendations, the public health system in Ontario uh, is involved to some degree in 20 of those 23 areas. So it's a great example of building on the assets we have, scaling up programs uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make a difference. Uh, so uh, turning our three-pronged strategy into action. Uh, so we need leadership, and we're really pleased that uh, on the day we tabled our report, um, the Minister of Health, who's now the Deputy Premier in Ontario, announced that she and the Minister of Children and Youth Services will co-chair a ministerial uh, a committee of, I think, six or seven ministers, key ministers, uh, to move the strategy forward. Uh, investing in child health, so that's repurposing current funding, but also uh, making uh, new investments. And we recommended, uh, based on the fact that Ontario is below the average of per capita spending uh, well, actually, Ontario is almost always below the average in per capita spending in any domain of health care, but that includes, uh, includes in this area, and that to increase uh, to, uh, uh, to the national average uh, would bring us to an $80 million new investment. And then finally, of course, um, because of the point that Kelly made earlier, uh, that there is a, a consensus around the need for action, but a lack of consensus around where to act and how to act, uh, that we really do need to plan, do, study, adjust on a continual basis. And to do that, we need evidence, obviously. Um, I'll wrap up quickly. Uh, this from our transmittal letter to the minister, and really our call to action to you and our challenge to you, to everyone in this room. One of the things that happened in the course of our panel is that everybody, every single one of us, had to move off of our preconceptions uh, and learned new things and had to bend in terms of what we thought um, uh, the toolkit should include. 
And so you might imagine it's not just, as Kelly pointed out, the different interests. And you might also imagine that a medical officer of health uh, versus somebody from an advertising agency versus an academic versus as somebody who works at Loblaws might all have different perspectives, not just on what's important, but how uh, evidence should be interpreted, and in fact, even what evidence is. And so what we learned was we all need, all of us, whoever you are, need to be prepared if we're going to make meaningful process to move off uh, of our initial uh, preconceptions and be willing um, to, uh, to, to bend to figure out what the package of interventions can be that can make a difference uh, because the stakes are high and the stakes are really high uh, and uh, we need to always keep that in mind above all else. So I'll end there and happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you very much Kelly and Alex. It was an honor to be on the committee and I must say I opened my own mind to many different uh, points of view and I changed my mind. And uh, in terms of benchmarks of success, there was no attrition rate and we all left the experience uh, having learned a great deal and uh, let's just say uh, respecting Cal Kelly and Alex for their extraordinary abilities at managing the herd of us. So there's a few minutes here for uh, questions before we turn it over to Yoni and um, uh, let's uh, please uh, come to the uh, mics. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, <clears throat> during this morning's session we had a presentation from uh, US CDC and they um, gave an example of how within CDC food policy had um, changed um, and that then induced suppliers to and government contract uh, businesses to s supply better foods and um, it had an impact on the whole of economy. Um, when I'm at work, my kids are at school um, and you had mentioned uh, the different groups of stakeholders that you had involved in your consultations and I'm assuming that schools were involved in, in the sector discussions. And I'm, I'm just wondering um, to what extent uh, um, schools would be encouraged to um, reduce their marketing to uh, children of unhealthy foods um, in terms of fundraising programs uh, like the pizza programs that, that are weekly. It's very difficult as a parent really to, to uh, uh, battle against that. And I know it's an important kind of uh, way for schools to raise funds, um, presumably that aren't uh, aren't uh, available because of uh, decreasing uh, um, provincial funding and tax revenue. So I'm, I'm wondering how, how, um, how um, uh, your recommendations might per pertain to, uh, to these types of issues. Thank you, it's a great question. I, I just heard the other day when someone says, thank you, that's a great question, it means that they're trying to think of their answer. Um, it is a great question. So for sure, schools, teachers, principals, school boards were part of consultation process and we had uh, the schools represented on our panel as well. And if you think about your kids, just as you mentioned, they're at school for several hours of the day and it's difficult to have any kind of parental influence over your children when they're, they're in a different setting. And so um, while we believe there are many initiatives that the school needs to take, and there are a few of them mentioned in here, for the most part, our recommendation is schools need to be at the table. So they need to be part of the process when we're turning strategy to action. We need teachers, we need schools at the table helping us understand what is their contribution to making the healthy choice, the easy choice every time for the kids in the province of Ontario and the kids in the country. And so if you think about them at the table, uh, some teachers in Ontario, we've just had a lot of issues with their Ministry of Education, and teachers um, may say they can't put another to-do on their to-do list, but we also know, and what we heard from teachers, is that they want to do what's best for kids. That's why they're teachers. And so there will be things that they're able to do, some things they're not able to do, but certainly they need to be part of the discourse and part of the implementation plan going forward. I, I won't go through them. There are probably half a dozen rec recommendations directly related. Uh, to schools, to nutrition in schools, uh, to the fact that the um, education on reserve is not under a provincial mandate and therefore requires attention um, particularly. Uh, so a number of recommendations. I encourage you to take a look at the report. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just clip it to uh, the three remaining um, questioners at the mic and then we'll uh, turn to uh, Yoni. Thank you. So um, let's begin, um, I think, uh, with yourself. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Jill Hamilton. 
Um, what I've noticed over the years is that there seems to be this separation between a lot of health promotion prevention type recommendations and then uh, more the treatment type recommendations. And I, I do see that treatment of childhood obesity uh, for the one third of kids who are already obese um, uh, is a form of secondary prevention for adult chronic disease. Yet we don't see that coming out in these documents as often, I think, as perhaps need be. I also know as a clinician, I hear a lot of stories from families who uh, find there's a lack of resources to get help for this. And in, in Ontario, I think we have, at last count, six programs for the whole province. Some of our patients travel five hours to come to our clinic. So I saw there was one recommendation in the report that was ensure families have timely access to specialized obesity programs when needed. And I was just curious to know how that conversation happened because I'm, I'm sure it came up through the, through the panel. Yes, and so thank you for the work you do. We've got Dr. Stasha Hachinakis is here from CHI. I have to do all these promotion of CHIO's expertise in this area, who uh, of course is the medical director of our Center for Healthy Active Living. Uh, so understand the concern. It's a one-year wait list, Stasha, right? One-year wait list uh, to, uh, to get into our program. And that is why, in fact, one of the recommendations is uh, to uh, improve access to the specialized programs, both access in terms of uh, shortening those waits, but also access in terms of broadening the reach. Uh, so uh, it is on the radar, uh, and um, it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, seen by the panel as an important priority for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, let's have a, another question. Hello, I'm Julie Rochford. I'm a community dietitian at, uh, on Angelina Island in Ontario. I work at an Aboriginal Health Access Centre and we serve as seven First Nations on the island. And I was just, I came a little late, so I apologize if you had already addressed this, but I was just taking a look at your, um, the members, and I was wondering if there was any Northern Ontario representation because I find that I was born in Northern Ontario and raised mostly in London. And, there is a different mentality towards health and health disparities from Northern Ontario versus Southern Ontario, especially when being access to specialized services. For instance, our kids have to go to CHEO or Toronto Sick Kids, so there is those realities. So I was just wondering if there was any Northern Ontario consideration. Yeah, so there was both uh, Northern Ontario representation uh, as well as uh, representation of the Aboriginal community, both in terms of the panel, but also in the, uh, extensively in the consultation um, that the panel did, uh, including uh, some of the focus groups, as Kelly mentioned, that took place in, in Sudbury. So um, I think that was one of the areas we were uh, sensitized to was the unique challenges around um, addressing uh, the epidemic uh, in uh, Aboriginal communities and why province-wide solutions, uh, when you talk about existing delivery systems, won't always work uh, because so much of that system is federally funded and regulated. And so uh, there is discussion uh, in the report about that, and it was one of the, uh, uh, one of the areas of focus. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so our last question, and then we'll uh, flip to Dr. Friedhoff. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catherine Birkin, pediatrician and researcher at SickKids. And I'm part of a team that's developed a practice-based research network called Target Kids, where we focus on the early years in primary care practice. So I want to first congratulate you on the report, and specifically around your C uh, recommendations around, I'll just read them, using evidence to monitor progress and ensure accountability. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit to the discussion around that and your plans to ensure that your C recommendations um, are put into practice. Yes, so uh, we talked a lot about measurement and accountability monitoring and uh, what we agreed was that we wanted for the most part to have this evidence base but there are some things where there's just there is no evidence and so some of the recommendations are based on consultations and sort of best known information at the time and so the whole part of C is to say let's start down this track, let's measure as we go, some things will work some things won't. If they don't work, let's adapt and re-engineer it. Um, but let's be sure that we're evaluating every step of the way. Uh, let's hold us as a province accountable to deliver on these uh, recommendations. And so there is a recommendation in here to establish a, 
a group, a committee, not sure what it would be, that would actually be accountable for monitoring this on an annual basis to say, are we, are we doing what we said we would do in the set of recommendations? Are we implementing them? And are we realizing some success? So we had big conversations about all of Part C, and um, it's a huge piece of our overall set of recommendations. And a, and a big challenge because there are no existing surveillance systems in Ontario, for example. A big challenge. So thank, thank you very much. And on those uh, two themes of accountability and evidence, sorry, Alex, did you have a? Can you get? So uh, uh, very yeah. brief. I'm not going to add to Kelly's answer. It's very complete. I would say we're going to have an Ontario budget this afternoon. Um, we expect that either named in the budget uh, or allocated for will be some resources. That's a hopeful expectation. I'm not in a position to announce the budget. Uh, but for those, of you, for those of you who are in Ontario, uh, I really would encourage you to have your institutions, to have your organizations make the case for the recommendations. Uh, like now is the time. There's an interministerial committee. They are deciding which ones would go first. Uh, so on your point around surveillance, for example, like make, make the case. Make the case.